We want to welcome the 1,189 house churches locally, nationally, and internationally. Let's give them a hand. Amen. Um, use the video and the invitation to receive Christ and have a discussion. And uh, that's as simple as it gets. You know, use the video, use the invitation to receive Christ, have a discussion. Put the heart emoji on our Facebook page if you are opening a house church or you already have, so we can be praying for you. Maybe someday I'll have this memorized, but not yet. Amen? Amen. Uh, in the last five days, we've had 535 people contact us about last Saturday's message. Amen? So let's Amen. give them a hand for talking about So when you're sitting in this room tonight, when this camera clicks on by Sunday night, Probably about 10,000 people will watch this service, but 535 this week contacted and said, hey, um, that service ministered to me. Um, so just picture 500 people in here with us. Um, and this core group of people have been faithful for three and a half years, and God's really just started to bless what we're doing. And we opened a new house church today in Chilliquan. Johnny's here tonight. What was so awesome is they watched one of the services at three o'clock and they had house church, everything was cool. And Johnny told me, he goes, you know what, Randy? I need to come see you in person. I saw you in my house on video, but need to come in person. So I'm glad he's here tonight, amen? Amen. So let's give him a hand for yeah. coming back. <laughs> so Sam and Sean started knocking doors at 9.30 a.m. last Sunday morning they stopped knocking on doors at 2 p.m. in the afternoon by the time they were done they had went to 35 homes and prayed for multiple people uh, they handed out 40 flyers and some books a uh, major ministry happened uh, praying for people in their homes they were desperate to be valued it, it, it kind of amazes me. It, it's so awesome that Sunday morning, while the churches are worshiping and praying and saying, God, move. Right. Uh, hey, girl, come on in. Miss, you want to grab Earl's little girl's book? Amen. Come on in. What I thought was so powerful is while the churches are singing and praying and praying for God, remember, keep your eye on the ball. Amen? Amen. Amen. I know you've seen a little girl and her mom before. So uh, stay focused. Good to see you in there. Um, we'll get her book over to her. And the Lord showed me as these churches are praying, Mike, Sally, Jesus is actually over going door to door while they're praying for God to move to bring people in there. Amen. And uh, Ken, the Lord's going, I'm already out here while you're in church opening churches, opening house churches. So that just kind of pumped me up. Remember, 770 people live in Chilliquin, 385 of them over and above that, will never come to a church. So when we made this flyer, celebration and motivation service, or we can help you open a house church. You know what Johnny said? When can we start? Amen. That's right. I mean, the first time we go out, a house church opens. Because people don't realize you can actually have church in your home. Amen. Amen. And um, so that was pretty exciting. Um, so I wrote here in my notes, they were desperate to be valued. Jesus said the harvest is white. The laborers are few. Pray that the Lord of the harvest would send out Sam and Sean on Sunday morning into the harvest field. Pray that the Lord would send out Jackie into her new neighborhood. That's right. Amen. Now I'm working at the gym. I'm at work. One of my client's daughters who's getting ready to go to college in Salem 
walks up to me. We'd never met. I trained her dad. And she started talking to me. And she goes, now, Randy, I heard you're a pastor in Chilliquin. Now, this is a 17-year-old, awesome young woman of God. But she starts asking me these questions. And the Lord goes, you need to go get identity theft and the testimony book. And this gets way better once I leave the gym. I'm just trying to share with you what God's doing with me because it's hard for me to push her on if I'm a bum. Mm -hmm. It's hard for me to sharpen somebody else if I'm not doing it myself. Because mm -hmm. you know what that is? A hypocrite. Mm -hmm. Somebody telling Patty to do something and Leonard and they're not even doing it themselves. Right. That's hypocritical. So I hand her the books and she didn't even know I'd written books, explained them to her. And I said, if when you get to college in Salem, if you want to open a house church at the college or you need to give out more books, just contact us. So cool. Awesome. I'm pumped. I get done with that client. I'm getting ready to go do some in-home clients. I'm walking down the street. And a neighbor of mine that I've never even met yet runs out of her house, 80 years old. Randy, 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 I got a piece of your mail. I didn't even know she knew my name. <laughs> I've never, I, I've met my other neighbors, but I hadn't quite got to her yet. <laughs> so we start talking and she throws me a little jewel. She said, man, I'm so blessed to have the neighbors I have. And when she said that, I said, hey, I've written a couple of books you might like. Mm -hmm. Now, let me tell you something. Mm -hmm. There's this little 12-year-old Native American girl pulling <laughs> weeds in her yard. So here's this little 12-year-old, beautiful Native American mm -hmm. little girl pulling weeds. She's probably 30 feet from us. So I said, I'll walk over to my house. Walk back, get them, hand them to her. So I hand them to her. She's saying, Randy, I'll read them, but I want to give them to my daughter, who's in 60 years old. So I said, great. So she said, do you know the Jacksons? Mm -hmm. I said, yes, I do. I said, my aunt's a Jackson. She goes, well, I was best friends with Clara Jackson. Right. Clara Jackson. Mm -hmm. Clara Jackson. So what's the odds of me, you, you feeling it, Sally? <laughs> See, what's awesome about Sally right now is we haven't even got to the message yet. Right. So she goes, oh, yeah, I used to spend days living with Clara Jackson. Here's the bell. Here's the bell. Here's Clara. Praying in Heaven, Indian Shaker Church, 1910. So listen to this. We're talking. The little girl walks up right next to me. The little girl, Pearl. And she goes, can I have two of those books as well? I need to read those books. And then I know I need to give them to my mom. Amen. And this is a whole nother aspect of the family of the tribe of children. Oh, wow, yeah. Man, I was just trying to get home. <laughs> that was on my own street. So I come back and I give the little girl the book. Who knows right. that little girl except Jesus? Amen. But talk about bold, Pearl. Mm. Twelve years old, and she interjects herself into a conversation Amen. and says, I need those books. The harvest is white. The laborers are busy. The laborers are tired. The laborers just bought four quads, just bought a piece of property, just got married. Please excuse me, Jesus. I'm busy. You're never going to talk to the 80-year-old across the street. 
It won't happen. You'll never hand the 12 year old books because you'll be so busy getting to where you need to go. They can't say, hey, Randy, I got your mail. Right. Oh, she got my mail on purpose. <laughs> Amen. Oh, yeah. I'm not boasting about myself. I'm just saying if I'm not doing it weekly, then I won't speak with conviction. I'll keep bragging about what I did in the past. I'll keep bragging about 10 years ago. Oh, 20 years ago, I was doing X, Y, Z. Well, what are you doing now? I'm tired. <laughs> right. Was that a new, is that an evangelism course? Tired? <laughs> Remember, the Holy Spirit in you is not tired. That's yeah. right. Boy, I was higher than a kite the rest of the day. I'm still high on the most high. Amen. And then Sean and Sam are at Johnny's at 3 o'clock before church, opening a house church. That's right. I was like a proud papa on Sunday every time Sean and Sam texting me. And they never had to call me once till the end, <laughs> which was fine. The only hesitation they had was in one home, and it was an Indian Shaker church lady. And they started talking to her about house church and started talking to her. And she was, you know, kind of, and, and Sean goes, you know what? They gave Randy one of those bells. <laughs> Boy, when she started talking about the bell, she goes, what? Oh, yeah. Randy, there never in the history of the Indian Shaker Church has one of those bells been given to a non-shaker. She's like, come on in. <laughs> Tell me what you're doing. <clears throat> bell favor. Mm -hmm. That's a new term. You got bell favor. <laughs> now remember, Native Americans powerful have been praying since 1910. Mm -hmm. now, we're, just, we're just riding the wave of their blessing. Amen? Amen. When that woman looked at me and said, I used to live for seasons with Grandma Clara. You about had to peel me off the lawn, man. And she said she was a powerhouse. The Friday market team have just been knocking Satan in the head for months now. They were just busy all day Friday. I get up early to get ready to go to work, and I'm like, oh my goodness, man, the, the whole team is out working this morning at the Friday market. A pastor contacted me and said, well, Randy, are you out there doing? I said, I'm at work. He they, they goes, you mean your church people do all of that on Friday by themselves without you? I said, yeah, over two months. I think I heard him pass out and come back to life. <laughs> he said, I've never seen that before. He goes, I have to do everything. I said, well, maybe you need to come to church and let us teach you something. <laughs> Amen, Pastor? Amen. Amen. So the Friday market team, now it's two months and three weeks, I think. Ministry um, happening at Friday market. Ministry happening on Sunday. Uh, Monday night house churches, Tuesday morning house churches, Tuesday night house churches, Wednesday morning house churches, Wednesday night house churches, Thursday house churches, Friday house churches, Saturday house churches. Look at what this room is doing. Amen. And God gets all the glory. You know, Haran signed into the Lamb's Book of Life three weeks ago when we had to have church in a house. Mm -hmm. Now he's in house church Wednesday night, and then he gets together with John and um, Leonard as well. So he goes from making that decision to taking advantage of house church. Blue came last weekend, signed in Lamb's Book of Life. He was sitting in my house Wednesday night. Yeah, man. It's all available, Dan, for anybody. Mm -hmm. 
Salvation is free. Discipleship will cost you your lifetime. Salvation's free. But to stay rocking and shocking, you're going to have to be around people that are fired up. Because we've been learning through the soils. Once you step towards Christ, Satan comes demonically or through people to influence you to fall away. We don't wrestle against people, but Satan uses people. Amen? Amen. You got to just be careful when it's a person you think you have a problem with. It's usually a principality that's been following you, following them, and it's got bad intentions for both y'all. If you don't know what y'all means, go to Oklahoma for a while. (laughs) Y'all come back now. So tonight we're going to talk about the psychology of wealth and riches. Wealth and riches is what picks off most Christians in the time we're living in. Now, most of us come from very low means. So when we hear the word wealth or riches, we think of somebody rich. But we are opening house churches in countries where they make 25 cents a day. Their income is 25 cents a day. So a rich person to them is probably somebody that makes 300 a month. If that person makes 600, they're super wealthy. So we've got to be very careful because we think, oh, I'm not wealthy. I'm just barely making it. Well, roof over your head, mac and cheese in your cupboard, 50 cents in your pocket, you're in the top 5% of the wealthiest people in the world. Top 5% of the... And Harant knows what I'm talking about. This guy's been in those regions. He knows. So we always got to humble ourselves or what we're going to talk about tonight will we'll wander away from Christ and, and we'll still think we're saved, we'll still think everything's cool, but we're not. So we're going to go into the third soil tonight. So we're going to talk about psychology of wealth and riches. Psychology is the study of the human mind and behavior. Satan will study your behavior. He will listen and make notes on everything you say, the people around you say, and what you react to. And that demonic principality will follow you till the day you die. And I know you guys don't like when I say that, but next week we're going to really nail that down when we get into good soil. When I want to do good, evil is right there. The moment you start doing good, you think, oh, I got saved. I I kept coming. Oh, I, I got through the hard path. I got through the rocky path. The worst ones when you get blessed. I've seen so many powerful people for Christ. All of a sudden, God's blessing comes and you never see him again. Look at your neighbor and say, you're going to learn something today. Earl, you're going to learn something today. Her neighbors are little kids, so they didn't know what to do. All right, let's go to Matthew 13. We're in the third soil. These will be some of the most powerful teachings you'll learn. They're all on video. So when you meet somebody in these four stages of their walk with Christ, you're going to have to really warn them, Sally. This is what's going to follow you the rest of your life. So Matthew 13, 7. So this is the parable first. And then we'll look at at the interpretation. So Matthew 13, 7. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Most all of us, when we get saved and get really focused, other things have already grown up around us. Our past, the relationships we're in now, the relationships that grew up around us that choked us, 
But the interpretation, Ken, is a lot clearer. So the interpretation of 13.7 is 1322. Oh, you're going to like this. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth. The deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. The moment you start getting blessed, deception can come. Oh, yeah. And then all of a sudden, when you barely had two nickels to rub together, you were happy. Yep. Top ramen. Man, if you were able to go out to Popeye's Chicken like Missy and I, when we were dirt poor, one order, one strawberry soda. Yeah. Man, we were living high on the hog. Yeah. But guess what? We never forgot that. As we've prospered, as we've gotten wealthy, as we've walked in riches, guess what? We can go back to top wrong. God can yeah. take it all away because once you played at rock bottom, bring it on, Satan. Bring it on. I was preaching hard when I didn't have anything and I'm preaching hard when I have something. No different. <clears throat> so, deceitfulness. So we know the word. Deceitfulness means having a tendency or disposition to deceive to not be honest. You know who you're not honest with? Yourself. You say, I'm still saved. I'm still on fire. I go to church once a month. I go to church occasionally. I don't really want to disciple people. I don't really want to be involved with people. You know, I've got a job. I got my money. I got my car. I got my stuff. I love Jesus. You know who you're deceiving? Yourself. Yourself. Randy, wealth can choke the word of God out of me, making my life unfruitful for Jesus. You got it, Toyota. Yeah. Wealth is one of the most devastating things. And like I said, don't think of a wealthy person. Don't think Ferraris and all that stuff, mansions. No, no. Compared to the most of the world, where you live, what you have in your cupboards, what you have in your pocket, you are in the top 5% of the wealthiest people in the world. Oh, we're going to go deeper into this. And guess what happens when you're not fruitful as a Christian? The Bible says your branch withers, it's cut off and thrown into the fire. Now, why on earth would that be in the Bible? I think we're supposed to be producing fruit. And the Bible says, Mike, if Mike and Randy are producing fruit, guess what God's going to do? He's going to prune us back. Amen. He goes, you got a little too much. He's going to prune you back so you can produce more. I like that. I like that God likes to cut into me once in a while. Oh, you don't like that. Iron sharpens iron. So one person sharp. Now, I was a journeyman meat cutter for a while in my young life. And in the mornings, three whetstones. And when I got done sharpening my knives for the day, I'd hold out my wrist and just take that hair off real easy. And then I washed it with bleach so it wasn't in your New York State. <laughs> But you know what? Did a lot of work with those knives. I had to keep them sharp or I would get injured. A dull knife will injure you because you're struggling with it. Yep. <clears throat> All right, let's go to Luke 8, 7. This is Jesus talking about the same thing again. But now we have Luke. 
Luke was a physician. This guy was a doctor. Left everything. Matthew was a tax collector. Left everything. Remember that left everything statement. So now we're talking to the physician here. Luke 8, 7. Other seed fell among the thorns which grew up with it and choked the plants. Some of the people you grew up with, you got to lose them. Bad company will corrupt your personality. It's not that you're not going to minister to them, but you're going to say, I'm going to this level, come with me. Because once you turn back around and go back down to them, they're usually strong enough to pull you back into your sin. All right. All right. It's okay. Silence is good. You're thinking about it. So let's look at the interpretation. Luke 8, 14. The seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, by life's riches, by life's pleasures, and they do not mature. You would think when somebody starts getting blessed financially, why are you worried so much? You've got money now. Oh, you're using your time to pleasure yourself. Now you're worried. And now, Sean, it's about money and pleasure. Not about the Word of God, Johnny. Said you heard it. You understood it. But Leonard, you should be a teacher by now. We never matured. This is the third soil. They do not mature. The definition of mature is fully developed. Worry, riches, and wealth, and pleasure, you never grow up as a warrior of light. You do not want to understand you should be teaching others by now. You cannot even discern good from evil. We got Christians now that say, Randy, what I'm doing isn't bad. It's not bad. Jesus loves me, this I know. Could the Bible tell me to? <laughs> oh, you haven't matured. You're still talking baby talk. <clears throat> Are you getting what I'm cooking? You're still talking baby talk and condoning sin in your life. As a Christian, I'm not the unsaved or unsaved. I'm talking about people that have heard the word. You doing okay, Dan? All right. You never grow up into a warrior of light. You do not want to understand. You should be a teacher of others by now, but you can't even discern good from evil. It, is there more in the Bible about that? You know what, Mr. Timothy, again, I was so impressed with 1 Timothy. We tore Timothy up last week, or he tore us up. And here he is again, in 1 Timothy 6.10. 1 Timothy 6.10. Now let me preface this, Johnny. He, this is talking about Christians. Mm -hmm. let, let me help you. This is talking about Christians, and I'll prove it to you. 1 Timothy, not 2 Timothy. 1 Timothy 6. Johnny might say, you know, I like watching this guy from home better. <laughs> he's, he's, I'm just giving bad time. He's 65 years old. He can handle it. I do talk to people, John. I pretty much talk to everybody because this is my family. We That's warned right. you. That's right. We warned you. <laughs> Sam warned you. That's good. That's good. Okay, so let's read this scripture. 1 Timothy 
For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Well, that's the wealthy. That's the unsaved. Isn't it ironic that people with money have a root, but people who accept Christ and fall away have no root? But you can have money and be a Christian and your root, Leonard, is in the evil. Is that there too, Ray? For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the... Oh my goodness! We're talking about saved people have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Oh, that's good preaching right there. Oh, amen. Simple as it gets. <laughs> Money's not evil. No. It's when it controls you. That's right. Money's just a tool. But when it dictates who you are, where you are, and what you do, you're in trouble. Amen. That doesn't mean you shouldn't have a job and work hard, be on time, get off. But the reason you're at work is to be a light. Yes, the money is just residual mm -hmm. blessing. I'm self-employed, so if I want to fire myself because I'm witnessing at work, that I'm not going to do that. Randy, we're not going to fire you. What did Luke say? Worries, riches, pleasure. Isn't it interesting? Christians who love their stuff more than being obedient to Christ have a strong root into all kinds of evil. And they wander from the faith and they injure themselves. Dan, have you seen any Christians lately that are wandering and they're injured? Two. All right. I'm on right track because if Dan says he's seen two of them, then it must be real. Amen? Amen? Randy's preaching the truth. Look at the definition of wander. Walk in an aimless way. You're a Christian and you're a walking zombie. You're the zombie apocalypse. You're just walking around aimlessly. The word aimless means, oh, I love this, without purpose or direction. Have you met any Christians lately with no purpose, no direction? You need to say, hey, can I come over to your house and teach you three messages? Well, I'm not a teacher, Randy. I'm not a man. You've been in church long enough. You can take these verses. Sally, if she taught it to somebody, it'd be good because it'd have Sally sauce on it. <laughs> And say special sauce. She's special. I'm talking Sally sauce. That's right. Pearl sets somebody down and starts breaking this down to them. Ooh, pearl sauce. That's right. See, but we don't want to come to church and have somebody push on us to minister to people. You're always going to get pushed here <clears throat> because you're loved. Yeah. <laughs> Timothy in the Bible is talking about Christians falling away that are more eager for the things of the world than to be obedient to Christ. Is that in the Bible too, Randy? Yep, yeah, let's go to 1 John. Let's make it legal, all right? Oh, Randy's just saying stuff. No, this is what the Bible says. Amen? 1 John, not 2 John. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Anytime you come on Saturday, you're going to learn a lot of scripture. That's why it's good to have a house church or get to some, together with somebody a week and say, you know what? We need to dissect what Randy said. They talk too fast. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Still some pages turning and that's fine. 
If we were in China right now, we'd have another 11 hours to go. <laughs> Yeah, the missionaries that are going to China, as soon as they, if they get in and can get to a group of people, 12 hours, Sean would be teaching, and this is what the Chinese people would ask Sean. Sean would go, well, what do you want me to teach on? They'd say, we want you to teach from Genesis to Revelation for 12 hours. That's happening tonight in house churches. They are so hungry and desperate for the word of God. They're not like these soils. These soils are not hungry and desperate. So 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Here's John talking. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes from, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God will live forever. All Satan has to get you doing is your will. All Satan has to do is knock you off one degree and by the time you go 500 miles, you're way, way far away from God. But it was just a little bump. Yeah. Randy, can someone acknowledge God and walk away from Jesus because of their possessions? Oh, Man, it gets so quiet, it's quiet. <laughs> Randy, can someone acknowledge God and walk away from Jesus because of their possessions? Turn to your neighbor and say, that's a good question. That's a good question. <laughs> good question. Could that really be in the Bible? <laughs> you betcha. <Yeah. clears throat> My friends... This is back when we all had CBs, Breaker Breaker 1-9. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Big old whip antennas. Yeah. And my friend's dad's call sign was, you betcha. <laughs> you know I'm a hick when you're saying you betcha. <laughs> but I'll be Jesus' huckleberry anytime. Let's read that one more time because that shocked you. You even had to tell your neighbor. Yeah. Randy, can someone acknowledge God and walk away from Jesus because of their possessions? Mark 10, 17 through 23. Now, I know I'm not going to be real popular with a lot of lukewarm people, but boy, people that are desperate around the world, 535 of them said, you know, bring it on. So let's go to Mark 10, 17 through 23. Mark 10, 17 through 23. It actually, the title of these scriptures is called The Rich in the Kingdom. I'm just waiting for the pages. Mark chapter 10, Gospel of Mark. And it's important that you know these verses and you know where they are because you can teach somebody them. Mark 10, 17 through 23. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his face before him. Good teacher, good teacher, good teacher. He asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus goes, why do you call me good? Jesus answers, no one is good except God alone. So here he goes. This is a religious person. This is a person that submits to a rabbi. This is a person that's been taught since they were probably 13 years old. They know how to be godly. So listen to what Jesus says. You know the commandments, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not defraud, 
honor your father and mother. Teacher, teacher, he declared, all these things I've kept since I was a boy. I'm on it, man. I got eternal life, kid. Hold up, Bubba Bean. Hold up, little guy. Jesus isn't done talking yet, Sean, right? He said, one thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven, then come and follow me. You know, Dan, why a lot of people can't follow Christ? They're stuck. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to him, how hard is it for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God? Now, as a plant quarantine inspector for the state of California, could have worked there the rest of my life, no problem. Those are hard jobs to get. Missy was the assistant manager of Hallmark. You move up to management at Hallmark, you know, 30-something years ago. We'll be married 32 years this year. We go to a little pioneer church at a bombed out KOA. And the pastor goes, Randy, we'd like to hire you as our youth pastor. And he said, but we can't pay you anything. I said, pastor, you have a nice day. Nice to meet you and your wife. So as we're driving back from Gardnerville through Carson City into Washoe Valley, the Lord spoke to me as clear as he speaks to me now. Quit your job and move to Gardnerville. Quit your job and move to Gardnerville. Missy's to quit her job. You're both to move there with nothing. We'd been married 30 days. We'd been married a month. I looked over at Missy. I said, Miss? She said, yeah, I ran. I said, God just told me I'm supposed to quit my job. You're supposed to quit your job. Married a month. Mm -hmm. And she looked at me and I know God told me the same thing. <laughs> Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. We had to live with a widow because we had no place to live. I was so pumped at the little market in Gardnerville when they had Top Ramen on sale, 10 for a dollar. <laughs> I mean, when I had a dollar... To go buy 10 top ramen, living with a widow. And you know what? Those were some of the best days of our lives. Amen. And I'm not talking the soap opera. For all you people that watch the telly. I know. So see, you're going to stand behind a pulpit and give everybody lip service. You're going to stand behind a pulpit and get paid a salary, get taken care of. That's between you and God. But would you do it for free? Would you step away from everything like Luke did, like Mark did, like Peter did? Peter owned his own business. Peter was married. They say he probably had children. His mother-in-law got sick. Jesus had to pray for her. Well, Randy, that's, that's child abuse. That's, that's just not right. Yeah? Jesus said some of these teachings are hard. Yeah. Randy, can a person know God's voice and be blessed by God and become evil? Well, let's read that one again. Oh, this is fun. Randy, can a person know? This has helped me so much with all the clowns I've dealt with in church. Randy, that's disrespectful. No, if you saw the stuff that I saw, it's not of God. The clown is being nice. Randy, can a person know God's voice and be blessed by God and become evil? Leonard, are you listening to me? 
and turn away from God. When Solomon grew old, when Solomon grew old, Mike, they say the wealthiest person that ever lived. <clears throat> Solomon was the wealthiest person that ever lived. They say he had up to 150 children. Uh, yeah, yeah. The ladies was his problem, just like his dad's. Oh, yeah. And little old Samson, always needing a haircut. You know what happened to Samson after Delilah cut his hair? They took a spear tip and cut both of his eyes out of his head. And then they stuck a blazing torch, seared both of his eyes shut with the eyeballs laying on the ground. Read your Bible. It might help you. But it's bigger than that. You always lose your spiritual eyesight. The enemy causes you to wander. Mm. And you know what Samson did, Johnny? He said, I'm going to shake myself. I've been here before. I'm going to shake myself, tear some stuff up. Well, guess what? He shook himself one time too late because mm -hmm. his anointing was gone. When Solomon grew old, he worshipped other gods. So Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord. This is what the Bible says. Even though he was old, he did not mature. God said, Solomon, I'll give you anything, riches, anything you want. He said, Lord, all I want is wisdom. He goes, because you chose wisdom, I'm going to give you everything on top of it. But Solomon, one thing I ask of you, do not marry women from foreign countries. By the end of his life, he was worshiping the most horrid gods on the planet. That's in 1 Kings 11. That's your homework for tonight. Just get a little bit of hot milk or warm milk or something you like. Lay down to bed and read 1 Kings 11. Let it just slap the snot out of you. Rand, I was liking the warm milk until you said snot out of you. Randy, where is Christianity today here in America? Jesus warned us in 96 AD in the book of Revelation when he told John what to write. Now remember, these verses are talking about the church in 2023. We're getting ready to read something that was written in 96 AD that's working today in the church in Christianity. This is the last church age dispensation before the rapture of believers before the truth. You want to hear about this? Yeah. yeah. All right. Revelation 3. This is going to help you. So this is the last church dispensation. There were seven letters written to seven pastors. And what's ironic about the seventh letter? It was written to the lay leadership. Laodiceans. Yeah. It means in the end time, these churches will be run by elders, yeah. deacons, lay leaders, not run by Christ. Mm -hmm. This group of individuals will take over. Remember, for 300 years, there was no buildings. We had elders and deacons, but these guys were ministering. They were taking care of orphans and widows and helping the apostolic accomplish the vision. These guys weren't hiring the apostles. <clears throat> Chew on that one for a while. <laughs> Revelation 3, this is the church age we live in right now. Revelation 3, 14 through 22. To the angel, which means the pastor, the leader of the church in Laodicea. These are the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the rulers of God's creation. I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. 
I wish you were either one or the other. If you're cold, he can warm you up. If you're hot, he can give you direction. But if you're lukewarm, you think you're fine. Right. When you're lukewarm, I'm fine. Me and Jesus are like that. Like the guy said at the back door last week right. when I asked him if he wanted to receive Christ. Yeah. Oh, Jesus and I are like that. Cool. Awesome. Rock on, baby. Verse 16. So because you're lukewarm. Now remember, he's talking to the church. He's not talking to the world. So because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to vomit you out of my mouth. Jesus is literally vomiting the church out. The church is making him sick. The Bible says he'll write Ichabod. My presence is departed and they won't even know it. They're in there worshiping and preaching and Sam and Sean are right next door opening house churches. While the church is praying, Jesus, bring them in here. Jesus is praying for them. I wish you would go out there. Amen. You keep wanting them to come in here. But I need you to go out there. Amen. There we go. You say, I'm rich. I've acquired wealth. I don't need a thing. And as Jesus says, but you do not realize that you are wretched. Ken, he's talking to the church of Laodicea. This is Jesus talking to the church age. We, are we a rich church now in America? We're the richest churches on the planet. We have pastors now that buy $58 million planes for personal use and church use. If I buy a $58 million plane, Ken was a sniper in Vietnam. He has permission to shoot me. Put me down, man. Ken, put me down. Randy is worthless. $58 million. All right. Yeah. Made my heart beat a little fast. But you do not realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. There's going to be some people sitting in their homes watching this this week and go, I don't like the way he talks. I don't have to put up with this. And you're right, you don't. They're in the comfort of your little home with all your collectibles and all your stuff. Get out and do something, amen? Amen. 18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich. What? And white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes. He's talking to the church! He's not talking to the world. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. People use this all the time for altar calls. Mike, Sally, they use this to get this unsaved saved. And it's not talking about the unsaved here. He's talking about the saved to become lukewarm, Dan. Mm -hmm. See, at the end, when Dan's giving me a little smile and he's rocking a little bit, <laughs> that's all I need, Sally. <laughs> that's all I need. It don't matter who was here, who wasn't here. Dan smiling and rocking a little. Melody, I think we're hearing angels sing. It's good stuff. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. There's no doorknob on your, his side. The doorknob is on your side. There's no knob on Jesus' side. Pearl has to grab the door and open it. 
Verse 21, to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church. Yeah. Why do you got to yell? I don't know. But it feels good. <laughs> Are you a Bible thumper? Maybe. <laughs> That upsets people too. <laughs> hey boy, we don't pay you to push us. Why well, ain't your boy and you don't pay me? <laughs> so you got a big problem. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, Missy and I courted for a year. So if she's laughing after 33 years, <laughs> It's even better than Dan's little smile. And <laughs> These verses are warning Christianity not to wander away. No purpose, no direction. Proverbs says where there's no vision, you're going to perish. Proverbs said where there's no vision, the people always perish. That's 2918 for all you theologians. <laughs> and guess who wrote that? Solomon! <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! Yeah. <laughs> he didn't even read his own books, man. <laughs> Mike, Solomon was old and did evil. That's the guy that wrote that verse. Yeah. What happened to that guy, Ken? Yeah. Oh, Randy, but she looks so good. <laughs> <laughs> you just don't understand, Randy. Oh, Randy, man, he looks so good. You just don't understand. You're right, I don't understand that way, but I understand the other way. Oh, Lord, I think I heard the dinger going off. The potato out here has been cooked. <laughs> the potato is now ready for butter and sour cream. Hey, maybe a little bacon. Let's get crazy. <laughs> Jesus said, seek first the kingdom. Now I realize why, Sally, I'm so upsetting to Christianity. Because, Patty, they don't want to hear this. They don't want to hear this. Seek first the kingdom and everything else will fall into place. Even in that scripture text, Jesus said, not even Solomon in all of his glory was dressed like a flower. Ooh, that's painful. I mean, that's in the word of God for eternity. Jesus is saying, this is the guy that did evil. In all of his splendor. It's not good when you're in the Bible and Jesus is saying all of your glory. Everything else will ask yourself today. Are you all in? Or has the cares of this life caused you to fall away? Are you all in? I'm asking you there in your living room and all those house churches. I'm talking to you people that have been saved 10, 20, 30 years. And guess what? You're not going on the first load. Because anything else pulls you away and you wander and take care of your stuff. I know there's some unhappy couch dwellers right now this week. You doing okay, Johnny? Yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> So now we're going to give an altar call. People will get saved every day this week all over the world. Because we came, we set up a camera, we turned it on. We said, Lord, we're going to be there, we're going to do it. So let's pray a prayer.
The Bible says, believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, you'll be saved. That's Romans 10, 9. In Acts chapter 2, Peter is quoting out of the book of Joel, talking about all these prophetic things that will be happening to people and on the earth. He said, man, they'll just call on the name of Jesus and be saved. And some people have a flip fit about that, Leonard. But can you imagine if there's a 747 angel, Dan, circling the earth, preaching the gospel, it's in Revelation, in every language and tongue. Do you think what you're going to do, Dan? Jesus! That's right. I'm sorry! I'm sorry I had to wait till the angel come to believe that you were real. I got left behind. I don't want to chew my tongue off in my mouth and get by, hit by a hundred pound hailstone. Jesus! Dan, you get in the picture? That's right. It's me and Dan tonight. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're milking that cow. Even the train's saying, milk that cow, Randy. Milk that cow. Sorry, we're tr you're trying to get saved and I just went off on a tangent. <laughs> That's normal for me. I'm a tangent, accomplished person. So pray this prayer with us. Those of you there, we're going to give you an invitation. All, all the homes, the thousands of homes, thousand homes around the world. Just take some time to bow your head, close your eyes. Just repeat after me. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus I, believe I believe that you hung on a cross, that you hung on a cross and that you died. And, that you died. and paid for my sins. And paid for my sins. Jesus, Jesus, I believe, I believe that, you rose again that you rose again on the third day. On the third day. Jesus, Jesus, I ask you, I ask you into, my heart, into my heart as my Lord and Savior. As my Lord and Savior. Jesus, Jesus, I love you. I love you. Amen. Amen. Awesome. When one is saved, all of heaven's rejoicing. Just got a newsletter that John and Debbie have given me. John, Deb, uh, this ministry is having 25,000 people a day coming to Christ in China. A day. All house churches. All house churches. So the next time you want to bag on China, be careful to keep your mouth shut because the greatest revival on this planet is happening in China. Don't judge a whole nation of people because of a group of leaders doing something. You need to realize you got to speak life over China because Jesus is harvesting it. Don't look at the bimbos, right? Mm -hmm. Think about the people that are coming to Christ. Amen. And that will make you pray for China, not curse it. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Two amens. Praise God. No one. All right. <laughs> so put the heart emoji. On our Facebook page, if you're opening a house church, you already have. Use the video. Use the invitation to receive Christ. Have a discussion. If you haven't watched on YouTube, house church, the only option, watch that service at Dan's house that we shot in a home. House church, the only option. That thing's gone around the world because there's a lot of people we preach to. There will never be a church building in their town. It will never happen. And Ken, when they find out that house church is in the Bible, guess what? They have never heard that from the Western church. All these countries that have been evangelized, we need your 25 cents a day so we can build the Crystal Cathedral over here. And I think Jesus just threw up. Is that in the Bible? We already talked about it. Yes, we did. Randy, you're so vulgar. I, it's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. One time I was preaching at a youth service, a big youth service, and I preached that scripture to a bunch of young people, and I reached down, pulled out a mason jar full of pea soup and oatmeal. Started shaking it. And I said, you don't want to be this in Jesus' stomach. 58 kids got saved. <laughs> Maybe I need to bring some oatmeal and pea soup in here. <laughs> Yummy. <laughs> All right, praise God. Contact us, Facebook, uh, Last Days Harvest Ministries, YouTube. We love you guys. 
Uh, be blessed, and we'll see you again next week. Amen? Amen.